Today we are headed to a ghost town in the dry Nevada desert. But it wasn't always dry. This ghost town was devoured by water and on purpose. Come along with us and join the adventure. Welcome everyone to Weekend Escapades. Behind me you will see where St. Thomas used to lay right here in this valley. And this valley is now a ghost town. The lush, muddy river valley shown below is dramatically changed from January of 1865 when the town's namesake, Thomas Smith, and nearly a dozen Mormon men and women arrived at the confluence of the Virgin River and the Muddy River to build a community of St. Thomas. Let's explore. Headed into St. Thomas, ghost town, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of wind out here. So this is the uh, site. There's a loop that we're gonna walk, 1865 to 1938, and this is Lake Mead National Recreation Area. So Lake Mead being right over that direction, and there's a lot to do with St. Thomas because one of the reasons that this is a ghost town is because of the building of the dam is why this was a ghost town because it flooded and they made everybody move right now well, let's explore what's left as we walk in you can see the change in the terrain right away because all of this was underwater and there's evidence of that as we've been here before uh, but you can see on the ground their shells is a very good example of that so these are fresh water shells because this was all flooded. All of these were plants that were underwater in this whole area. As we get closer, you'll see more seashells. I'll share those with you. And then what's left of the ruins, we haven't been here in over a year. And who knows, the, the landscape changes so quickly because uh, of weather out here in the desert. And a lot of flooding has been happening this year as well. Let's get closer. So I was talking about the, the shells. You can literally see it's almost like the path is just paved with little pieces of shells. The settlers of St. Thomas thought that they were in Utah or Arizona territories as the boundary lines were not well defined. December 19th, 1870, a boundary survey determined that St. Thomas was actually in Nevada. County tax collectors demanded that settlers pay several years of back taxes in gold and silver coin immediately. The settlers had little faith that the tax payments made to Nevada would be used responsibly, and they did not possess the required currency. As payments to Utah and Arizona were made by an informal bartering system, the townspeople turned to Brigham Young for advice. He allowed them to take a vote to stay or go. The next day, December 20th, 1870, the majority voted 63 to 2 to abandon St. Thomas. The original settlers departed, but because of the attractiveness of the area, St. Thomas was gradually repopulated over the next decade. Daniel Bonelli and his family remained in the area to operate the Bonelli Ferry along the Colorado River. He also operated a salt mine and was a successful rancher. Bonelli invested in the irrigation systems that were already in place. So as people moved back to St. Thomas, he benefited monetarily. So you can see behind me these giant stumps. You know, these were beautiful trees that were here when St. Thomas existed, but all the water and things that they had that flooded this area. You can see another giant stump back over there. Those are very large. Uh, again, the streets were lined with beautiful trees. As we get closer, you'll see it, but they cut them all down because well, before they flooded it, they were worried that they were gonna have uh, boats that would get damaged by all the trees. And this is one of the foundations right here. Now there's no placard on this little patio there, but made like most of the old pioneer towns. You can see this one, the way it was built over here, these slats that were in the wall are probably where the floor joists would come across this way and build a nice solid floor. The walls were all crumbled down, deteriorating. Most all of it built out of like uh, sand or mud with a lot of rock. 
So when we come up on these first foundations, like right here, you'll see in the back there's a cistern over there. Uh, they've got them all graded off it, for good reason. Some of them are really deep. But you see these little stumps. These were all cut off. So this was uh, lined the streets. You'll see them way out in the distance as well over here. We're going to walk right down the middle of Main Street and do this loop. But these were cut down before they flooded the area because they were tall and they didn't want them to, uh, you know, get stuck on boats or anything that maybe, uh, because, you know, this was under 20, 30 feet at least of water, if not more. This is one of the foundations. Kind of the basement area under there. Families lived here in these homes. This was the home right here. So it says life changed little through the decades as people dealt with daily struggles and excessive heat. There's the picture of the home, complete picture of it. There's a lot of grading around it, but that is, that is the cistern. You can't even see the bottom of this one. Well, you kind of can. There's some, some debris in there, but that's very deep. I hope you can see this well. So this is the trees. They kind of line the rows. You see the trees go down that direction as well. But this is what happened. They lined the whole town, the streets of the town. Look how close these trees are. It's almost like a wall of trees. And it goes on forever. Now there was a railroad where they used to load cattle and all the crops and everything that they had. And it was said to be out there, but there's no tracks or anything left. But that whole line right there is just all tree stumps that they cut down. But they lined all the roads. As I say, this town was known for all of its greenery and trees because they had this a very nice place. I mean, we're out in the middle of the desert and this place was just, it was really happening. A lot of running water they piped in here and these streets had water running right down them to keep all these trees green and everybody with water. And I guess they used a sand filter to keep this water clean for all the residents so they have a sand filter system for all these cisterns that were here. And you can see again those trees that lined the street. Those are all the stumps. Fascinating. I would have loved to have seen this when it was bustling with all these beautiful trees and people running around here. Okay, so here's a good example. Here's the uh, cisterns where they used to, like a well, they'd drop a bucket in there and get the water out for the houses. And then they had the running water down the main streets. You can see there, but look how green and lush it was. That's an example of those tree stumps we were looking at, of what they'd look like. I hope you can see it, the sun's kind of hitting it. And you can see uh, the cisterns that are here and the way they operated. a big chunk of metal there as part of one of the cisterns. Somebody must have found that and brought it and laid it here. Part of the operating system of it. That is an old chunk of metal, kind of a gateway thing on it. It's fascinating. Every time you come out here, another big foundation there as well. Every time you come out here, there's more stuff laying alongside the uh, the cisterns and in areas because people find stuff and of course they leave it here but they kind of leave it exposed so people can see what used to be here. Everybody's looking for the uh, block of a old General Motors V8 motor. It still has the uh, cable attached to it. <laughs> Be able to lift it. There's a lot of railroad car pieces out here because they did have a railroad here. Some of this stuff is in the wash. Probably wash the dirt off the top of it. I don't think that the water would wash a lot of this here. It's too heavy. That's definitely some railroad iron there. Whatever that would be. A random sidewalk. But it's probably leading up to this house that's right over here. Or what's left of the foundation of the house that's over here, I should say. 
it's really hard with uh, ghost towns, a lot of ghost towns, especially this one, right? So it's, it's leveled out. But one of the things we do, it's, it's really exciting to be on the ground. Hopefully you can hear it in my voice because when you're here, you realize how, I guess, beautiful it would have been by looking at the tree stumps. I talk about those a lot because there's so many and it was beautiful here. But then what's left of these houses to think that all of these people were displaced and all the hard work and labor that went into building this. And then they basically just told them, hey, we're gonna flood it. Everybody evacuate. Take what you can out of your homes, do what you can. But you're gonna leave this area that you built that's been around forever from pioneers, from your relatives. And now we're gonna uh, just submerge it in water. And then who knew that it was gonna come back out of the water and make it a location for us to visit and see, I guess all of the, uh, the homes that are left, the businesses that are left, the foundations of where people once lived and had a great life. These foundations are one thing, leaving a little bit of what remains or what was, but look at this. Tell me that this location didn't have some giant trees. I mean, in reference, look how big this tree stump is. It's huge. So making a living here in St. Thomas, businesses along the Arrowhead Trail, farming and ranching were the main occupations over the years. Although a few small businesses did spring up along the dusty roads of St. Thomas, uh, Reinhold and Solinda Hanning built the grocery store and soda fountain, also known as the Hannock Ice Cream Parlor. The remnants of this building are right here in front of us. Uh, Preston Nutter operated the grocery store just down the street and William Sellers opened a cafe along the Arrowhead Trail and the Gentry Hotel provided lodging for weary travelers. Okay, now this placard here represents uh, that there was mining, so mining mountains. Uh, it brought prosperity to the community for a few decades. Uh, salt and sand were mined nearby. Uh, minerals such as copper, silver, and gold were abundant in the mountains uh, to the east of St. Thomas. And that would be those mountains right over there. Because that would be east. There's a huge foundation next to us as well. During World War I, the copper prices were high, but with the end of World War, uh, the price of copper crashed, causing an immediate downturn in the local economy. So this is St. Thomas. You can see on horseback in front of a couple of the buildings, but all the trees and the big wagon train. Well, this is one of the bigger foundations uh, that was here. You can see there's footings out here. Four footings. Large footings for the front of the building. Probably held up a awning or a porch. That's a good sized building right there. And they have these little uh, outcrops, I guess, these here. Look like they would have been for like daylight windows for the basement. Or what was underground. Kind of falling away from the building now. Cement foundation there. There's another little one out there. There's a lot of the metal. People find metal and just put it on the walls here that was used in the buildings. Almost looks like an old pocket knife or something. See, it's got a hole on each end. Interesting. Old pieces of plate. What might this have been? Now there's a giant foundation right in front of me. I'd say it's probably the biggest foundation, the biggest foundation that still uh, remains. There was a hotel here and a couple of other things that we'll see right down the road, but this one is the school. Now there's a lot of very popular photos 
of this location. It's interesting, you can see the twisted steel that they used in some of the pillars that used to build this up. And the iron from this building. But all along the outside of this column is that twisted steel that comes out right up there at the top. This school was giant. There's some good pictures of this school with the kids in front of it. Right over here is the stairs. We can go stand on those. Those stairs are still in good shape. I find this fascinating. There's so much work that went into these giant buildings and school. Now this was the grade school, I guess, that's behind us. But right here is what they called the churn. And that's a real picture of the churn. Students bound for high school in nearby Overton bounced along <laughs> in a covered, excuse me, not covered, converted Model T Ford truck lined with benches. And one of the uh, Flora Keller remembers calling the bus the churn and having an uncomfortable ride over rough gravel and dirt roads because Overton is 15 miles from here. 15 miles that direction through this little valley. This is a huge building. Stairs are still in pretty good shape. You can see the uh, notches in the cement where the floor joists went across, I'm sure. Still fascinated by the twisted steel that's in all the uh, all the construction. Walking on the wall here, you can definitely see that. It's huge. It's like inch, inch and a half twisted steel that made up these supports. Okay, so this is the other side of the loop going up uh, on the road. Now this is going to lead us right up to the hotel that's up there where a very important person stayed. I'll share that with you when we get up there. But you can see the tree stumps again that line this road going up. Now right here as we were walking in you can see all the seashells but they're still all right here. Look at these uh, well seashells, I guess freshwater shells. <laughs> You'll see them just laying around on the ground proof that it was underwater for some time. So we're by a foundation now. You can see the landscaping from the stones, but also maybe a piece of old chimney pipe connection or something. Just never know what you're going to find. And of course, a lot of this old iron was used this iron was used to hold the buildings together. Maybe a piece of a barrel, top to a barrel or something. Interesting. This is out here back where the water would have been coming into the house. And that is, that's a big piece of pipe in that. And that is in the ground. Let's take a look. It's just interesting as it was a, a big town. So you never know what all these parts were for and foundations were for because there's not that many photos of all of these buildings completed and a lot of the foundations are just crumbled up. As you can see this one was more of a stone build with some cement but it had larger stone so this was a stone house. I don't know if this was the other ice cream parlor or a little store. But it said it was over on this side. Maybe you can get a better look at what that was. Not real big, maybe like 24 by 12 or so feet wide. Okay, so this building here was actually the post office. St. Thomas Post Office lies right here. You can see the walls. That was the doorway right there but it fell over. So this was the wall and the doorway. See, that would have been the entrance right there and it just fell down right here. And 
this is what's left of the post office. Get another angle of it. As a reference, we came in over here, looped around, and then came back up the street here. And we're going to head into now the Gentry store, which is right over that direction, in the Gentry Hotel. Welcome to the Gentry store. It's like it had a little entranceway sidewalk there. Looks like it had some large stone foundation here, some stone walls. I'm literally standing in an old store where people used to shop. That's probably the back door there to head out. This one is the first one I've seen that has the large stones laid out in the perimeter of the building. So it would be an interesting build, like a little sidewalk in the front of it, right here, where the walls just crumbled down over there. Gentry store. So Gentry store being right there where we just came from, all these beautiful trees, these stumps, they're not beautiful trees anymore. These were all in front of the Gentry Hotel. Now this was supposed to be an amazing location. It was very ornate with garden. And I'll tell you what, this foundation is really flat. You can see <clears throat> they poured cement around the perimeter of the foundation, but here's those big stones that were part of the support. So just a small cement wall. There's the foundations of it there. And this would have been the side entrance. Right here. We've got a good picture of this, but you can see the cistern there. You see where the water kind of ran right through there. And a lot of this is covered up. The water would have ran through there all the way around this building came out over that direction right in there so you can see more trough for the water back over here if I remember correctly there's some complete bricks that you can see that the building was built out of let's see if I can find some of those but this is all the glass that they've been finding everybody collects the glass that's been here Puts it right up here on this stone. Some old pieces of metal. Oh, that is heavy. But all this was used for the Gentry Hotel. That's fairly flat now. Okay, so over here by the cistern, right here, these are the bricks that it was built out of. Now, there were a lot more complete bricks here almost a year or so ago. That gives you a good example of how they were built. Right there. And there it is. So this is rest for the weary travelers. This had 14 rooms. And uh, several of the governors and senators, as well as President Calvin Coolidge, enjoyed the amenities of this thriving establishment. And you can see right over here where it came out. It had kind of an alcove window. That would be right here. So this is the whole front of the hotel. That's all of that right there. So where these ladies are standing here would have been right there. To think that that is now that and it was under a significant amount of water. There's a larger photo of it right there. Now we talked about the Gentry store and the Gentry Hotel. Of course, very prominent people, they had to have a fairly nice home. And this would be that home. This had to be one of the biggest houses here. It looks like it was almost the size of the hotel. The walls were obviously finished with stucco, finished up. You can see they're nice and smooth. 
That's a good size home by today's standards, especially if it was two story. To live in the middle of nowhere. I bet that was their uh, guest house. I don't know. It was pretty close to the home. 360, all flooded with water at one time. And it was all abandoned because it had to be flooded because of a dam. That's a damn shame. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of draw out a picture. Beautiful trees here, a driveway entrance here. It went straight up to that house. And beautiful trees here. This driveway. You can see the cement on both sides, and there was a planter right here, and a planter over here. You can see the walls, and imagine coming up to this beautiful home with trees on both sides, lined with cement, you see it outlined, and there's your house, and there's the stairway going right up, your front door. There was some money here, for sure. This home was obviously built out of some kind of a brick as well. There's pieces of this brick laying here. And what happened was when they moved out of St. Thomas, when they told everybody they had to go because they were going to flood it, as in many ghost towns, they took as many pieces of usable product as they could to rebuild somewhere else. And a lot of the buildings, not a lot, a few of the buildings, moved into Overton, Overton proper. So some of the oldest buildings in Overton are actually from here that they took out of this area and moved them there. There's a couple old work sheds and, and old homes there now that are probably not homes, they're just used for something else. This is the last foundation that we're going to look at. But I think this one was very... Uh, well landscaped, very well built. Not the biggest house, but probably one of the prettiest with that nice driveway coming up to it. Fascinating ghost town in Nevada, right next to Valley of Fire and Lake Mead entrance. Well, that's gonna do it for today here from chilly ghost town, St. Thomas, and a little windy as well. We hope you enjoyed this adventure as much as we did because we certainly enjoyed making this video. It's a lot of fun on a sunny, cold day. And until our next adventure, goodbye from Weekend Escapades, and we'll see you in the next one. All right, so walking out, one last thing. We found a little piece of iron, very heavy piece of iron. Looks like it might have been a uh, hanger of some sort, like maybe a plant hanger flat on this side. That's pretty heavy. This is a town of many stumps. Can't get over it. There we go. Old stump with an old piece of iron.